This is a killer cab production. Here is 
Dr. Humar Johnson. Peace and black, black power family. For those of y'all who don't know me, I'm Dr. Umar Johnson. I'm a doctor of clinical psychology. I'm also a certified school psychologist. And I am probably the most infamous but I don't mind that because in 2019 we have very few black men who speak unapologetically about the conditions that affect black people do you understand me? especially those of us who have the degrees it seems like the more degrees we get the more cowardice we pick up so tonight brothers and sisters I'm going to talk about what we need to do to liberate ourselves and the first thing I want to do is I want to be very very clear in stating that there will be no other revolution for black people, not an economic one, not a social one, not an intellectual one, not a political one, until there is first a psychological revolution. It is the mind of African people that needs to be repaired more than anything else. Once you repair the mind of African people, you automatically repair everything else. See, people always ask the question, when I go to forums, they say, well, we're tired of talking about the problem. We want to talk about the solution. Well, the reason why you can't get to the solution is because you don't want to accept the reality that every Negro in America is half African and half European at the same time. The European is as much in us as he is around us. And until you crucify the coon that lives in you. Until you crucify the coon that lives in you, there will be no liberation for us. And as a psychologist, I can tell you that not every African is going on, going along with us for the freedom struggle. Just like in any war, you have physical casualties. Some people die. Well, guess what? In this war, you have psychological casualties. Some Negroes are so far gone that they're no good for nobody. So let me be the first to tell you, I'm not trying to save every Negro in Detroit because some of you are so in love with European culture that you'll kill me before you leave him. Because as revolutionary as Detroit is, you still got Negroes with a white Jesus on their wall at home. There's white Jesus in Big Rapids and Grand Rapids and Kalamazoo and Flint and right here in Detroit. And why is it we don't want to give up the white Jesus? Because we were inculcated for 400 years to believe that in order for us to solve our problems, it requires European participation. That's why every time you watch a black movie in Hollywood, we're always being saved by white folks. We can never save ourselves. You all saw the Black Panther movie. Even in the Black Panther movie, the real hero was a white CIA agent by the name of Ross, who jumped in front of T'Challa's sister and took a bullet for a black man. What CIA agent do you know has ever taken a bullet for a black woman? But let's stay with the Panther movie for one moment, because you gotta recognize that everything is political. There's no such thing as entertainment that is neutral and separate from politics. Every movie has an agenda. And Black Panther had an agenda. For the women in the audience, let me ask you a question. Why did you not see a single intimate moment in that movie between a black woman and her husband? Why didn't we see a single black woman with a child? How can you have a movie about African people if there is no maternity in the movie? There is no mother-child interaction in the movie. Because the Black Panther movie is part of a larger design to execute black masculinity and destroy the foundation of the black family. That's right. Oh, yes. In fact, Killmonger was nothing more than a metaphorical representation of black conscious America. And for every African child back home who looks at that movie will get the idea that although black people in America are cultural in consciousness, they are also dangerous, Africa. Come on. Yeah. Leave them alone. Mm. And a message to African American children, 
is although you might love where you come from, they don't want nothing to do with you because the Black Panther himself was a selfish, elitist Negro who only cared about Wakanda and nobody else. Well, and because you wasn't studying what was going on in the movie, you were so overwhelmed by the theatrics of the movie. Ryan Coogler, who has a black wife, did an excellent job. I commend my brother. But I still got to take issue with the political messages in that movie. Because they were extremely dangerous. I went to go see the Harry Tubman movie the other day. Turn my stomach. How you got black men in this movie who didn't even exist in real life. And every last one of them was disrespectful to Harry Tubman's mission. The lead bounty hunter was a Negro who didn't even exist. Oh, come on. And he kills a black woman in the Harriet movie. I can't show my eight-year-old daughter the Harriet movie no. because she'll walk away with the idea of that Negro who didn't protect his own woman. Mm. Why would you use a movie like Harriet Tubman to push the feminist agenda? Yeah. Mm. And speaking of feminism, black woman, you better leave that alone. That's a white woman's mind product. That is not for you. Let's go back. How did they do to us what they're doing to us? Well, you got to go back to the execution of Dr. King. Everything we've been through this past 50 years is a direct result of what they did to Dr. King. Mm -hmm. See, let's be clear. The civil rights movement took America almost to the brink of disaster. They had to deal with the sit-ins, the freedom rides. They had to deal with SNCC and CORE. They had to deal with King and Malcolm. The civil rights movement almost socially bankrupted America. So they said, we're going to kill King, and we're going to create our own Negroes who are going to lead the black masses. And we're going to make sure black people in Detroit can no longer finance their own grassroots movements. And they said, how are we going to do that? They said, we're going to go into Detroit and Chicago and Philadelphia and New York. And we're going to go into all of the black cities of America. And we're going to economically devastate the black male by getting rid of all the factory jobs. Yeah. And then they said, we're not going to stop there. We're going to go into the high schools of Detroit and Flint and Kalamazoo. And we're going to take out all the industrial building trades so black boys will never again learn the skills that pay the bills. See, sending everybody to college is not a solution. And sending it, I got six degrees, and I don't believe in sending every black child to college. See, I went to college in 1992. That was my freshman year. I was probably the last class of black folks where a college degree had some relevance. And I just so happened to get lucky because I majored in psychology. And as long as Negroes are crazy, I can make some money. So I lucked up. No, I'm not saying no black child shouldn't go to college because some professions require college education. So we need some to go because we need some doctors, some engineers, some lawyers, some teachers, some psychologists. So I'm not saying you don't sit nobody, but we have made college an automatic rite of passage in the black community. It's something we just automatically do, and as a result of automatically doing it, most of us are going into debt by the banks of Michigan. Uh -huh. Raise your hand if you owe student loan debt. Look around here. Look at all of us. Paying off the banks. You can put your hands down. And most of us got our degrees in professions that we don't even participate in. You letting the banks hustle you, the white institutions are hustling us, talk about everybody go to college. That was a distraction invented in the 70s and 80s to get you away from the fact that they were taking away your factory and your industrial training jobs. And that's why when you look around Detroit, all of the new, publicly funded, paid for by your tax dollars projects that are being built are being built with Mexican labor, Chinese labor, white labor, and all the Negroes with college degrees sitting on the side of the road. We got, if we're going to fight for anything, fight to put the industrial building trades back into the schools. Two years, licensed plumber. Two years, licensed electrician. Two years, licensed carpenter. Two years, licensed welder. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The only trade we know is weaves and perms and barbering. There's more to the black community than stiffing weaves in people here. The black women, you better get away from that weeds because it's destroying your scalp and causing uh, brain cancer.
yourself in the countries that send you the weave out of Asia, Korea, and China. It's illegal to use those products in the hair of their own women. What are you doing? My God. And the black men can't talk about sisters with weave because we're the reasons they're wearing them. Yeah, come on now. They all be natural in 24 hours. But the black woman has studied the black man and has come to the firm conclusion that we're not interested in women unless they have a European veneer to them. So you want the African body, but you want the European hair and skin tone. So you can take the slave out of slavery, but until the slave takes the slavery out of himself, he'll never be free. Because freedom is a process. You got to go through stages of freedom. Y'all Negroes will read a book, go to Africa, change your name to Kanat Ura, Kanat Kema, Sataka. And come to hell back and say you free. When a white girl and a Jerry kill sit your ass down. Ain't no black man got no business being with anything other than a black woman. I said it, and I don't care who don't like it either. I said it. I said it. I said it. Ain't nobody gonna come and tell me what the hell I can't talk about. I talk about whatever I want to talk about, where I want to talk about it, because I was a free man, my son. Brothers and sisters, listen. We got five major problems we got to slay. Black Michigan, you got five major problems. Every black person got them. We got miseducation. We got mass incarceration. We got gentrification. Police genocide. And access to wealth. That is the five-headed dragon that black America must slay. And I'm here to tell you tonight, as we prepare to go into our third decade of the 21st century, that we can slay that five-headed dragon. But in order to slay it, it's going to take some sacrifice. Right. See, the problem with Negroes is we love to show up for events. But what we don't want to do is sacrifice for liberation. See, the room is always packed up to hear speech. But when it's time to put that money together to make a change for ourselves, independent of white supervision. Come on now. Come on now. Most of us are not interested. See, for most cultures in America, who they are is the glue that holds them together. And because of your self-hatred, your culture is something that you run from instead of run to. Why do you think we got a million names for ourselves? Are we black? Are we African? Are we Negro? Am I Hebrew? Am I Moor? Am I Nawapian? Am I indigenous? Because somebody told you, if you just come up with the right name, white folks will treat you differently. Well, I'm here to tell you, you can play alphabet suit all day long. No matter what name you came with, you will never be treated equally because your condition is not a result of what you call yourself. Your condition is a result of what you don't do for yourself. And as far as I'm concerned, if you want to call me more, call me more. You want to call me Nawapi, you want to call me Hebrew, African, Committed, it don't make a difference because I'm all that plus more. Do you understand? Just like when we fight over the names for God, is it Allah, is it Buddha, is it Ola Damati, is it Amin Ra? It's all of that in war. You cannot define the great undefinable. So why are you fighting over concepts for something that you yourself have never mastered? Because if you really mastered supreme consciousness, you would have already achieved God consciousness, and there's no way in hell white folks would still be running your damn life right now. So stop telling me how much you believe in God. You ain't got to tell me. Show me. Talk about how bad the schools are in Detroit, and they are bad. You got some of the worst special ed rates in the country. I read about that lawsuit y'all lost a couple months ago when the federal district court ruled that the Detroit schools were not obligated to provide children with a maximum education. I wasn't surprised. Five years ago, right here on this stage, 
Speaking for the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History, Detroit chapter, I told you that you don't have a federal right to get an education. The United States Constitution doesn't mention the word education. Education is a state right. It is a local uh, function in a federal interest. The feds only get involved to the extent that the state is violating your constitutional rights. But you don't have a constitutional right to learn. And guess what? The reason you see all these charter schools popping up is because the charter schools are here to help support the gentrification movement. I said charter schools are helping to push you out of your neighborhood. Let me tell you how they do it. And I live in Philadelphia. We have the most charter schools in America. Wherever you want to get rid of black folks, you open up charter schools. You know why? Because it's the best way to bring white folks in without getting no Negro resistance. Let me say it again. When you want to get rid of black folks, you open up charter schools because it's the best way to bring white folks in in large numbers without arousing the suspicion of politically uneducated Negroes. So if there's a certain section of Detroit where it's a black stronghold and I need to get them out, I'm going to drop a charter school right in the middle of that ghetto and I'm going to get a Negro to front the charter school like it's theirs, but it's really the white folks. And then I'm going to hire 90% white teachers and staff. They're going to move into that black ghetto in Detroit. They're going to buy up all the abandoned homes, all the abandoned churches, all the abandoned storefronts, all the abandoned lots. Uh -huh. You're not going to say nothing about it because what's wrong with having my son's teacher live down the street? What's wrong with having my son's principal live around the corner? But what you fail to realize, those white folks ain't going to teach your children. They're there to raise up the property values, to push you out. And 10 years later, the Hotep, Amin Ra, Malcolm X, Harriet Tubman Charter School for black kids that became the damn Adolf Hitler Charter School for white kids. You better say that now. Why you, don't, why you don't find charter schools in white suburbs? Why you don't find charter schools in white suburbs? Because charter schools is to get you out your own neighborhood. And I blame two people for why you don't notice. Your pastors and your politicians. The black church. The black church. I'm not against nobody's religion. I'm a descendant of preachers. Some of my greatest heroes were preachers. Bishop Henry McNeil Turner who told Frederick Douglass, we don't need to be fighting for a 13th Amendment, we need to arm the slaves and let them fight for themselves. He was a bishop of the church. He, uh, bishop Henry McNeil Turner, first black man to say God was black. Elijah Muhammad went to a school as a child in Georgia. That's where he got that from. That's where Garvey got it from. Garvey didn't invent it. Elijah didn't invent it. Bishop Henry McNeil Turner invented it. Right. He was a bishop of the AME church. Oh, Alexander Crumble, the first black man to build an institute, a literary society for black males. Yeah. Grandfather of Pan-Africanism was a bishop of the church. I ain't got no problem with no Christians. I got a problem with the way some of us let opportunists use Christianity mm -hmm. to brainwash you and keep you docile. See, let me be clear. Any religion that tells me I got to die before I get to heaven is a religion I don't need. Because when I look around Detroit, the Arabs got heaven right now off of you. The white man got heaven right now off of you. The Mexicans got heaven right now off of you. If the white man ain't got to die to get to heaven, I damn sure ain't got to die to get to heaven. You better say that, brother. I ain't never tell you to hate no white folks. I told you to understand white folks. We done gave them too much emotion. We can't afford to give them another 400 years of it. Right. Learn them! Yes. The reason the black church keep talking about it don't get in politics is because it's the most political institution in your community. Whenever somebody wants to get elected, where's the first place they go? To your church. Let's look at colonization. When you take over people, there's three institutions you must take. If you take those three institutions, you will own that people forever. One is the school, intellectual incarceration. One is the church, spiritual incarceration. And the third is the police force, physical incarceration. Mm -hmm. And if you got the school and you got the church, you won't even need the police because the Negroes will kill each other. And stop letting them tell you the reason black men out here killing each other is because they was born that way or they got defective DNA. Let's go back 80 years. Who was the drug dealers in Detroit? Who was the gangbangers? Who was running the rackets? It was Jewish immigrants, Italian immigrants, Irish immigrants. 
They did the same thing our young brothers is doing. Same thing that nobody said they was born to do. But in 1940, the white man decided to make the Irish white because they was not considered white till 1940. The Irish were not considered white till now. Do your research. European Jews may become white till 1940. And then to give them an economic stimulus package, they came to Detroit and gave the Irish your police department. Gave the Italians your fire department. They gave the European Jews the downtown municipal service jobs that they run until today. The question is, where's your economic stimulus package? You ain't going to get one. So that means we got to give one to ourselves. If we have enough money to do it. Black people are a $2 trillion community. $2 trillion! Your gross national product for a year is more than 25 African countries have to subsist on for an entire year. We ain't got no excuses. Why we ain't got no independent schools in Detroit? Why we ain't got a black hospital or clinic in Detroit? Why we ain't got a black supermarket in Detroit? Don't tell me about the white man. Tell me about you. Because you're the one who went out and spent all your money on Christmas gifts last week. Don't tell me about the white man. Tell me about you. $2 million on Ed Jordans every year. $4 million on liquor every year. Black women, $20 million on weave and perm every year. Black men, $3 million on Timberlands every year. And we want to go cry and talk about how the white woman is miseducating black kids. Yeah, it's true. I work in the schools. White women can't stand our damn kids. But guess what? Neither can you. While I'm talking to the parents, I'm going to give y'all some rules that y'all can use in the school. A new year coming up. But before I do, I want to first say thank you. I want to say thank you to Detroit. I want to say thank you to Flint, Kalamazoo, Big Rapids, Grand Rapids, Muskegon, all throughout the state. And why do I want to say thank you? Because five years ago, we started raising money to purchase a school. And we finally purchased that school in February of this year. And we don't have one school. We got two schools in Wilmington, Delaware. So thank you, Black Mission. Thank you, Black Mission. We got two schools in Wilmington, Delaware, four buildings all together. We have an Honorable Marcus Garvey building and an Honorable Frederick Douglass building. And right now we're raising money to try to renovate the Garvey building first because it's the smaller. <coughs> it takes us a million to do the whole thing. I'm not asking you for no money tonight. I didn't come here for that. I'm just giving you an update on where we are. A million for the whole campus, 350 for the Garvey building, and I hope we raise that money by April of this year so we can give the contractors until the summertime to get that school ready because I'm still hopeful we can open up school this September for our boys. I got a red, black, and green tile. Thank you, Courtney Mom. So I want to say thank you. And for those of y'all who are interested in working at the school, send me your resume. FDMG resumes at gmail.com. I repeat, FDMG resumes at gmail.com. Don't think about being a teacher. Think about being a nation builder. Now some of y'all are going to say, well, I'm not certified or licensed. That's irrelevant. What skill, craft, or talent do you have that our children need to learn? Maybe you make clothes. Maybe you create crafts. Maybe you build websites. Maybe you do documentaries. Maybe you grow food. The FDG Academy is for the sole purpose of raising unapologetically African alpha males who are masters in nation building. Yes. That's why we open in this school. What do we want to teach at FDG? FDG, we want to teach your son and ultimately your daughter. Because once we get the boys' school open, now that we got two schools looking at each other, we can start with the young African princesses soon. Yes, the Anna Douglas and Amy Garvey Academy for African Queenship. That's right. So we're going to teach them political and military science. Why is Africa the richest continent in the world, but the people are in the poorest condition? Why did Barack Obama become president of the United States and did nothing for black people? Why do you have so many black churches in Detroit, but we ain't got no black institutions to go with it? These are the questions that our children need to understand. Why every movie coming out of Hollywood is showing alpha masculine black males in a negative light? Mm -hmm. They need to know that in 1970, the U.S. government said we're going to destroy the foundation of the black family. So instead of the white, the black woman fighting the white man, she'd be fighting the black man. Mm. And instead of the black man fighting the white man, he'd be fighting the black woman. They got us facing each other instead of looking out together. Yeah. 1970 was the decade of economic castration. 1980 was the decade of the CIA's 
drug epidemic. Mm -hmm. So in the 70s, they took all the jobs out of Detroit. And then in the 80s, they dropped off the crack. Yeah. So you could either smoke your way out of oppression, or you could try to sell the drugs to feed your family. Either way, it's going to lead you to jail. And so then what did racism give us in 1990? So 1970, economic cash station. 1980, chemical warfare. 1994, Bill Clinton's crime. Mm -hmm. And had you studied Bill Clinton, you would have knew he was going to do that mm -hmm. because some of his major campaign financiers were private prison corporations. Right. But see, the problem with Negroes is you don't study politicians. You only look at about how they make you feel. That's what's wrong with Negroes. You got to like people to vote for them. And even if they don't do nothing for black folks, if they make you feel good, they can get your vote. Mm -hmm. You're the most politically immature voter in America. That's why you don't get nothing for your vote. Right now. Every last one of you going to cast a ballot for Democrat. You ain't heard nothing. No program. No platform. Nothing. But the black bourgeoisie of Detroit told you that to be a responsible Negro, you vote for Democrats. What the hell has the Democratic Party done in this city to earn your loyalty? Nothing! When it comes to black people, Democrats and Republicans are all on the same team. And can I ask you another question? Because I'm a political science major. Can you please tell me something black people ever got in this country that benefited us, that we got through a vote? Last time I checked, everything we ever got out of slavery, out of Jim Crow, Civil Rights Bill, Voting Rights Act, Affirmative Action, we didn't get it for the vote. We got to do organized street protests and demonstration. The vote ain't never bring black folks nothing. nothing. Name something we got through a vote. Nothing. You can't, because we never got anything through a vote. Voting is a waste of time until you organize and vote as black people. Until you do that, it's a waste of time. You want to vote as Democrats, vote as Republicans, vote as Christians, vote as Muslims. Vote as poor people, vote as rich people, vote as a frat, vote as a fraternity, vote as a Masonic Lodge, vote as a nurse, vote as a teacher. When the hell are you going to vote as a black person? Yeah. See, I don't vote for black politicians unless they can give me a program for one of the five problems we got. Cory Booker, Bernie Sanders, Donald Trump, Joe Biden. Do you have a program to deal with police killings of black folks? Do you have a program to get the schools back in order? Do you have a program to give black people access to the wealth of this, of this nation that our ancestors built? Mm -hmm. Do you have a program of action to stop white folks from pushing us out of our, say, our own neighborhood? Do you have a program of action to deal with the swelling prison situation? Yes. And I don't want no campaign promises. See, y'all good for that. They'll come in. I'm going to promise you I'll do my best. <laughs> and you go vote. And vote. Uh -uh, my vote is too important to me. I don't give it unless I see something worth it. So y'all can keep casting all day, and you'll be in the same condition you in in another 400 years until you understand you don't get into politics to get equal. You get equal, then you get into politics. Uh -huh. It's amazing. I travel this country. I can't find a single black community where we own a school, a hospital, a bank. Why? Nowhere I go. In America. I have been everywhere. There's no black community in this country where I can find a school, a hospital, a bank, and what's my fourth one? In the supermarket. You need the bank to invest in life, the school to prepare life, the hospital to protect life, and the supermarket to feed life. I heard y'all got stores in Detroit selling y'all old meat. How the hell you got stores selling you old meat and the store's still open? Where them damn pastors at? See, I'm tired of Deacon Pork Chop taking money, not using it. Yeah. I'm tired of Pastor Chicken Wings taking money, not using it. Yeah. Getting up here deifying poverty. Because you know the job of the black church is to deify poverty. To make you think being broke is a blessing so they can have all the money. Yeah. How many times you've heard, blessed are the poor. The meek shall inherit the earth. So when you go broke, you think you're being blessed by not having anything. Well, I'm here to tell you God intended you to be rich beyond your years. Money is not the root of all evil. Not having no damn money is the root of all evil. When you leave here tonight, are you ducking from millionaires or tainting my mind? You ain't running from no damn millionaires. You're running from broke black folks. 
who through desperation will do whatever they got to do to feed their family. And the reason why we can't make black people be loyal to black people is because we don't do nothing for them. We're the only non-white community in America that produces nothing for its own. Everything in the black community comes from outside the black community. There's no way you're going to hold your athletes and entertainers loyal to you until you can offer them something for them. It's easy for a Jewish kid to be loyal to Jewish people. It's easy for a Chinese kid to be loyal to Chinese people. They need a job, they can get one in community. They need an education, they can get one in community. When's the last time you've seen a homeless Chinese? They don't allow it. They don't allow it! I want to talk to my parents for a minute, and then I want to begin to wrap up, because I know whenever I speak at venues like this, there's always a time constraint, because they want to make sure I don't say nothing too much that's going to piss off the white financiers. I could care less. 400 years, and we still ducking from white folks' animosity. I'm not ducking no damn war. Step on it. Watch what you say, doctor. Oh. Black parents, I want you to listen up. Five rules for the schools. Rule number one: Don't let no more of your children in fourth grade or younger get evaluated for special ed. Oh. Unless you absolutely, positively believe in your heart and soul that something wrong with your baby. Because you know what's really going on in Detroit. It's not that your children have learning disabilities. They have lazy disabilities. You're talking to the greatest certified school psychologist in American history. I'm untouchable. Your child ain't got a learning disability. He got a lazy disability. If it was up to me, we wouldn't diagnose kids. We'd diagnose the homes they come from. When I'm in these schools fighting for your children, because that's what I do. See, I walk my walk. I walk mines. I don't sit on YouTube making videos all damn day. I got too much work to do. When I'm in school fighting for our kids, most of the time I'm not fighting white folks. I'm fighting Negroes. Because you want your son in special ed with that IEP. You want your son in special ed with that IEP, incarceration education program, so you can get that SSI check. That's right. The white folks don't mess with me. They see me come out. Here he comes. Just let him do what he want to do. <laughs> You're the ones who be upset. I disagree with you, Dr. Johnson. I really think my son got a reading disability. Really? Let's go to your house and see how many books is in there. How many books in that house? Yeah. How many books was on your Christmas list? Huh? A whole lot of Air Jordans, a whole lot of weeds, a whole lot of cell phones. I have a whole lot of tablets, no books. If I go in your house, Negro parent, and you ain't got a dictionary, thesaurus, and complete set of encyclopedia from A to Z, then you ain't on your job. That's right, that's right, brother. How are you talking about your son got reading props when you ain't even got no reading material? And shame on some of you black fathers who got your son thinking the best thing he could be in life is another Negro athlete. We don't need another Negro football player. We got enough of them. Lord knows I don't want to see another Charles Barkley as long as I live. Every time he opened up his damn mouth, he ain't got nothing good to say about black folks. Isn't it amazing that 400 years of this and black children, boys, are still socialized based on their physical abilities. I thought slavery socialized us to our physical ability. When you was auctioned off, your value was based on how much you could physically produce. How is that any different for LeBron James? Who I love and respect, by the way. He does some good things. But is his value in this world not determined by how much he can physically produce? Look at all these black athletes. Their value is determined by how much they can physically produce. So how is that any different from slavery? You would say because they get paid. And then I would ask you, does power equal money? Because if power equal money, Bill Cosby wouldn't be riding in a Philadelphia jail right now if power equal money. 
you black men better leave them white girls alone for you end up like Bill. I ain't got nothing against the white woman. I respect all human beings. White, purple, orange, don't make a difference to me. But I reserve the right to protect the black woman above and beyond any other female, because she mine. She mine. She is mine. I had a Negro send me an email last week talking about, listen, brother, I'm with you, but my wife is white. And I married her right out of college. Doc, I didn't have no black consciousness. So what am I supposed to do? I said, how old is your youngest child? He said, 12. I said, well, in five more years, you can sign your own emancipation proclamation. And if you need them light-skinned, we got light-skinned. We got French vanilla. We got lemonade. We got pina colada. We got butter, almond, butter, pecan, caramel, sweet brown sugar. It ain't nothing like some full-figured fudge. <laughs> Rule number one, don't let them kids get tested fourth grade or younger. Why do you say that, Dr. Johnson? Because every special ed diagnosis is a professional opinion. Ooh. Let me say it again, because I'm the first school psychologist in history to tell you that. I'm going to say it again. Every special A classification is a professional opinion. Wait, what do you mean? My son has a reading disability. My grandson is emotionally disturbed. My nephew is intellectually disabled. My daughter has a math disability, Dr. Johnson. I don't understand. Well, when you sit down with the school psychologist next time, just ask them. How did you determine that your grandson was reading disabled? See, when I bring your son or daughter into my office for testing, there's no x-ray, there's no CAT scan, there's no MRI, there's no urine sample, there's no blood screening. I give them an IQ test, I give them an achievement test, I give them a visual motor assessment, I give them an adaptive behavior assessment, I give them some sort of an emotional scale, a psychological measure, I interview the teacher, I interview the parents, I observe them in the class, I review the record, and then I put all this together like a magic trick. <laughs> and based upon what I think, and what you told me, and the scores on them tests, white psychologists in Detroit determine whether or not your child is learning disabled or not. It is no proof to it. If you go looking for a diagnosis, you're going to find one. So you take little Raheem to the white psychologist in Detroit, he gonna say learning disability. You take him to the Negro psychologist in Detroit, they gonna say ADHD. You bring him to Dr. Umar Johnson, Dr. Umar Johnson gonna say, it ain't learning, it's laziness. Yeah. And the ADHD is not an attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. His ADHD is ain't no daddy at home disorder. Yeah. Yeah. And if the daddy at home, this ain't no discipline at home disorder. Uh -huh. And if the daddy giving them discipline, then it's an artificial diet at home disorder. Peach. Peach. Too much caffeine, table sugar, and high fructose mm -hmm. corn syrup. And if you say the daddy there, and we got discipline, and we vegan, then I'm going to say there's one more. Attachment disruption due to home life dysfunction. In other words, there's too much abuse domestic violence, arguing, and absenteeism in that damn home for that child. Mm -hmm. And that's why he come to school not paying attention. Yeah. There's no neurological problem with his brain. His problem is y'all. Yeah. 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 If I'm wrong, proof. Any Negro psychologist in here would approve me wrong? Let's go. Let's go. You know I'm telling the truth. Yeah. But you're not going to say it because every psychologist knows you can become a millionaire misdiagnosing black kids. Yeah. Yeah. And stop giving them riddles. Stop giving them Adderall. Stop giving them Concerta. Stop giving them Medicaid. Stop giving them Vyvanse, Prozac, Paxil, Depakote, Risperdal. Oh Your boy don't need drugs in school. No. What he needs in school is what he ain't getting, and that ain't nothing but love. Get rid of the drugs and bring some people in there who love those kids, and we won't have this problem. 90% of all teachers in America are white women and they trying to act like they don't know what's wrong. 
the black male has always been considered public enemy number one, especially when it comes to white women. How about get rid of them white women to break some strong alpha males in these schools? They don't want to do that because that will disrupt the mass incarceration system. And for those of y'all who don't know, the purpose of special ed is to prepare your son for prison and your daughter for poverty. That's right. Most kids in special ed are in there for reading. They're not in there because they're blind. We got some blind kids, but not enough. We got some deaf kids, but not a lot. We got some emotionally disturbed. We got some intellectually impaired. We got some orthopedically impaired. But most black kids in special ed are in there for reading. You know why? First of all, let me say this. It is an embarrassment for you to put your child in special ed for reading. Well, we got ancestors who taught themselves how to read. <laughs> My four times great grand cousin and uncle, the greatest black leader to ever walk on American soil, the Honorable Frederick Douglass, taught himself how to read. And you need an IEP for your son to learn how. See? Post-traumatic slavery disease. The belief that I need the white man to do something for me before I can do something for myself. If your oppressor never invented special ed, where the hell would you be right now? Nobody telling you these drugs kill brain cells. Nobody telling you these drugs can cause schizophrenia, psychosis, tick disorders, weight gain problems, sleeping problems, sexual impotency, and infertility problems. Have you been watching the news? There's a group of white men filing a class action lawsuit against one of the ADHD medicine companies for giving them big breasts that got estrogen in the ADHD pills. If you don't believe me, do your research. I'm giving you facts. You don't let them test your child. When they say, well, he's in the fifth grade and can only read on the second grade level, then you tell them, let me tell you why that is, Mrs. Slurbanowski. <laughs> The reason my son is in the fifth grade reading on the second grade level is because last year in the fourth grade, y'all suspended him. Y'all suspended him. Y'all suspended him every other day. He wasn't in the classroom long enough to learn how to read anything. In the third grade, he had a brand new first year teacher from University of Michigan. Little white girl could barely read her damn self. Second grade, my son's teacher, Mrs. Pellegrino, Went out on maternity leave in January. My son had 13 substitutes from January to June. This ain't a learning disability. This is an educational disability. Stop letting them blame your kids for their failure to teach you. Education is the only industry I know of where the customer gets blamed for not getting what they paid for. You know what I tell white teachers when I do the training with white teachers? They always say, well, Dr. Johnson, I don't think I can do anything. Then why don't you resign from your damn job? Don't you take no paycheck on my kids yes. if you don't believe you can reach them. And then they telling y'all, well, we need more money. If y'all can get more money in the white woman's paychecks, this is how they use Negroes. And y'all go down to the Board of Education protesting for silent and Jesus. Money ain't got nothing to do with it. You could pay these white girls $100,000 a year and your son still be a special ed. Why is that, Dr. Johnson? Because money cannot pay for commitment and love of a child. Nobody should be in front of a child unless they love them. Black, white, or purple. Yes, yes. Children can feel whether or not you give a damn. Yes. A child ain't going to try unless you commit it to their best interests. Yes. In fact, a child's output in the classroom is a direct result of the teacher's input in the class. That's right. When I open up the Frederick Douglass and Marcus Garvey Academy, the first thing I'm going to tell my teachers, you better never come to me blaming anybody's mother or daddy for why they're not learning. Because the minute you do, I'm going to get rid of you and find somebody else. I don't even need mom and dad to make these kids learn. The job of a teacher is to motivate the child to want to do it on their own. Yes, sir. Yes. And all these teachers in Detroit want to do is talk about the mom don't come, the daddy don't come, and I'm not excusing you because some of you trifle. This takes me to rule number three. And this room is for every black mother in here. Don't you ever, 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 black sister, ever in the rest of your life go to your son's school with your damn pajamas on. Stop.
pajamas to school, black mother. The research has already confirmed that if the school thinks you are unemployed, they are more likely to suspend your child. They are more likely to call you up and come pick them up early. If you show up with pajamas, you are telling them that you don't have a life. You will be getting phone calls every day. Your son will be getting suspended every other day. You show up in pajamas, you make them think you don't take your son's or daughter's education serious. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's if they right. think all you want to do is go back home and get in the bed. Uh -huh. Come on now. You put some clothes on. Right. And from a black man's perspective, some of y'all be looking down right nasty anyway. Yes. Looking like a ghost makeup all smashed up. Sleep coming out your mouth. Put some shade butter on. What you buying for? <laughs> Rule number four. Don't go to no school meetings by yourself. Stop going to school meetings by yourself. This is for mothers, daddies, auntie, uncles, foster moms and dads, adopted moms and dads, custodial guardians. Never go to a public school meeting in Michigan again by yourself for the rest of your life. Why not, Dr. Umar? I'm not scared of them. It don't matter. You need a witness to the conversation. Yes, sir. You ever notice when you go to the meeting, they have ten white folks and three coons sitting around the table waiting for you? Yes, Why do they always bring so many people in for one black parent? Because they need to be able to reinforce the lie they're about to create. They're going to have ten people who are going to agree to something that never even happened. Now, who do you got with you? Nobody. Always take somebody with you. And black woman, if you can't take the father of your child to the meeting, take three or four of your girlfriends. And if you can't take your sisters and girlfriends and cousins, you go to one of the corners and get five of the weed boys. <laughs> I said go get Mike Mike, Ray Ray, Little Dave, Big Tom, and Little Shug. And you tell him, y'all gonna come in my son meeting. Because I need some backup. Don't talk. Don't you talk. Don't talk. <laughs> oh, and then they gonna say, do you want us to dress up? Oh, hell no. Come with wife beaters. Pants sagging. Smell like marijuana and Egyptian musk. <laughs> and I just want y'all to stay there like this the whole meeting. Stay at the white folks. Don't stay at them. White folks start to gang up on me and try to make me sign my kid life away in special ed or try to force me to put my son on some drugs. I want you to say, hey, bro, I got to go see my probation officer today. <laughs> How much would have been the white folks stop that special ed? They're going to say, oh, Mr. Queen, we so sorry. It's the warm time. Nice to meet you, big show. <laughs> you got to intimidate them the way they intimidate you. In fact, you can play games with them. How many people are going to be at the meeting? I just want to know how many people. Well, it'll be me, the special ed liaison, or the grade leader, classroom teacher, special ed teacher. I think the social worker may pop in. Pop in. <laughs> See how they play games? I think, no, you know, Danny. <laughs> right? So, so that's all about five. Five, you bring ten. <laughs> and then the white folks is going to say the special ed coordinator, the vice president, vice principal, dean, the student, going to say, well, is there a reason why you brought someone? Yeah, these are all his aunts and uncles. I can bring how many people I want to bring. Is there a problem? Oh, no, we just didn't. Oh, my God. There's a lot of Negroes in it. That's right. Push back. And don't trust the black person in the meeting. Because the black person is not on your side. Are y'all listening? That black person is there to make it look like it ain't racism. I'm telling you now, don't get brainwashed by the black principal. At the We Hate Black Kids Public School in Detroit, who got on a dashiki and a Shaka Zulu poster, some frankincense burning a green smoothie. That don't mean a damn thing. He will coon your son all the way to special ed. The black folks in education hate me more than the white folks because of that reason. See, at FDMG, there won't be no out of school suspension. Why would I send a black boy being raised by a single mother back home to a single mother? If she could do something about it, it would have been done. It's my job as a black man to deal with him. And because we are an independent school, I don't have to follow the rules of Detroit Park. See, I'm going to let your son know from the gate. You see all the brothers in here? You get out of line, my brother. 
Your mom come in here one time saying you was popping off at the mouth. We got a black room in the back. You understand? See, we ain't gonna have no discipline problems. Cause we gonna pound your damn chest in, little boy. Try me. Ain't gonna be no. See, once we get some black masculine back in these boys' lives, everything will go back in order. Next rule for the schools, if your child is ever classified as intellectually delayed, that means he has an IQ score of less than 70, you're going to contact Dr. Umar Johnson and you're going to fax or email me your child's psychological evaluation report because black boys in America are four times as likely as the white ones to be classified as retarded when they're not. That's right. Because the IQ test is racially biased. Yeah. And the reason why so many black boys in Detroit are walking around as intellectually disabled when they're not is because the verbal scale, I said the verbal scale of the IQ test accounts for the greatest percentage of disproportionality. What is the verbal scale on the IQ test? The verbal scale on the IQ test are the words that white people use that black kids never heard of. So why are you asking black kids words that you know they've never been exposed to? And can you please explain to me how not knowing a word that doesn't exist in my culture means I'm retarded? So then you might say, well, why don't they take it out, Dr. Johnson, if it's not a universal aspect of intelligence? Because that accounts for the 15-point black-white test scan. If you take out the verbal then the white kids don't look as smart no more. And you can't have that in Detroit. You know why you can't have that in Detroit? Because if the black kids start performing as well or better than the white kids, how are they going to explain only five black kids working on a medical degree at the University of Michigan? How are they going to explain only two black males in the education program at Michigan State? How are they going to explain so many few black girls in the nursing program at Wayne County Community? See, the way they can justify why black people are being denied opportunity is by saying your scores are too low. Yeah. If you neutralize the scores, you destroy white supremacy. Yeah. That's why they make you take a test for everything you do. You got to take a test to be a cop. You got to take a test to be a fireman. You got to take a test to work for the city. Test, test, test. Does the test predict how well of a job you can do? No. What does the test do? It confuses Negroes with white people's words, leading to the false conclusion that we're not as prepared so they can give all the jobs to the white I'm telling you what I know. My last rule. Last rule. If your child been in special ed for three plus years, I'm talking about the kids who really needed it, and they still not learning, I need you to know that you have a federal right to force the school district to pay for your child to go to a private school at school district expense. Federal law says, but you've got to be able to prove it. Federal law says if a parent can prove that the school miseducated the child, that special ed did not benefit that little boy or girl, you can make them pay to send your child to a private school and they got to pay that $20,000 a year. That's the law. White folks do it all the time. You never do. I also need you to know if you ever disagree with the evaluation, you have a right to a second opinion. It's called an independent educational evaluation. Did you hear what I just said? If they diagnose your child with something you don't agree with, all you have to do is write a letter, Mrs. Slurvenowski. I received my son's psych report. I do not agree. Y'all said he has a reading disability. I think he's just never been taught. I'm now requesting my federal right to an independent educational evaluation. Once you approve my request, I will give you the name of the certified school psychologist in Michigan I've chosen to do the evaluation. And guess who gets the bill? The school district. Guess what I'm doing in 2020? In 2020, I've decided and committed myself to a 50-state black parent Know your educational rights tool. I'm going to go to every state in this country. You care enough to know everything you need to know from autism all the way down to vaccinations. And by the way, speaking of vaccinations, this is Michigan. So in Michigan, you have a philosophical exemption right. Did you know that? In Michigan, your child does not have to have a medical excuse or a religious excuse. In the state of Michigan, you have a philosophical exemption. That means all you have to do is object in principle to vaccinations and your child can still go to school. Yeah. That's right. Look, it's quiet here. Yeah. He's short. You're damn right, I'm short. Come on! Yeah. Well, what you got to find out 
is in most states where there's a philosophical exemption, because I live in Pennsylvania, we also have a philosophical exemption. Texas has a philosophical exemption. Ohio has a philosophical exemption. All you have to do is write a letter stating that I object to immunizations. I take full responsibility for the consequences of my decision. My child can still be enrolled in school. You sign it, you give it, get it notarized, and you give it to the school secretary. That's how it is in most states. In some states, you have to send that letter to the State Department of Health or the Board of Education, and they will send you a certificate that you give to the school. All you have to do is find out how to do it. But I'm telling you, you have the right to do it. And that's why when I come back to Michigan, and I'm hoping somebody in this audience will help us find a place that we can use that can seat at least 100 people with tables and chairs so Dr. Umar can come back one Saturday in 2020 and teach all the parents who want to learn from autism to vaccination, A through V, A through V, everything you need to know to save your child in public schools. Who want to be at that training? We want to go to the IEP, we're going to the psych eval, I'm going to teach you about the manifestation of termination, the 504 plan, what can qualify a child for special ed, what shouldn't. And guess what parents, if your child is in special ed and they don't have a problem learning, the school is breaking the law. Let me say it one more time. Special ed is only for learning. Did y'all know that? Now you're going to say, but Dr. Johnson, my son is in special ed for behavior. Then they're breaking the law. You can't put a child in special ed for behavior unless the behavior affects his learning. Now, your son might be the worst kid in the school, but guess what? If he got straight A's and B's, special ed is off the conversation. So you happen to be talking to a black certified school psychologist who white lawyers call up and they send me the paperwork and they say, Dr. Johnson, tell us how to win this. In fact, if I could live life over, I would have never got my doctorate in psychology. I would have got my educational law degree. That's what I should have done. Could you imagine me in the courtroom, Your Honor? Yeah. <laughs> this cracker here is lying. <laughs> As I prepare to wrap up, take out your phones. I'm going to give you my number in case you need to reach Dr. Umar Johnson. If you've never been to Africa, we go to Africa every year. Last week in July, first week in August. Start saving your money up. I should have the information by February the 1st. All you have to do is text me. I'm also taking a Marcus Garvey tour to Jamaica this spring. If you want to go with me to Jamaica, we want to visit Marcus Garvey's grave, the UNIA ACL Division Number 1. We want to go and visit the Bobashanti Rastafari Kingdom. We want to visit Bob Marley's resting place. We want to go to where some of the greatest slave revolts in Jamaica took place. We're going to go through the National Museum of Jamaica. We're going to visit the politicians. And then at nighttime, I'm going to let you go party. Okay. And get your smoke on. <laughs> Phone number 215. 989-9858. 215-989-9858. Once more, for my special ed parents. I'm picking with you. You know I love you, baby. I love you. I love you. And by the way, ladies, if you send me a resume to work at the school, you don't have to be natural now because the school is still a year out. I want to make sure every African in here understands that when you show up for your interview, because there's going to be three interviews. One interview is going to be a tele-interview, so that'll be by your phone, FaceTime, whatever. Second interview, if you make the second cut, you get a second electronic interview. Last interview, you got to come to Wilmington, Delaware, and be physically interviewed with me and the selection team, okay? You don't have to be natural until, if you get hired, just show up for work natural, okay? So I don't want you to say, well, I'm permed out, he ain't going to want me. No, you can still go through a resurrection.
woman's still wearing the weave, you need to get on her. That's right. She ain't got to get rid of it all at once slow, by degrees. Because there might be some scalp damage under there. A little ringworm pit. Little... No, but Bob, I know what your scalps look like if y'all come to me to bulge. It looked like Iraq. <laughs> so, brothers, what you want to do is you want to get with one of these vendors outside and find somebody with some shape up. When she, get, when she go ball, you warm that shape up and you massage her scalp. And then you got to talk to the roots. Ball spot, go away. And kiss her head. And if you love your woman's head, I've seen it done. I'm telling you, it works. Love your woman's head. And in six months, you're going to have a full head of hair. That's right. I want every brother to make their queen go natural. See, one day I got to get married. One day I got to marry one of you queens. But you got to be natural when I hit you. I ain't got time to take you to the resurrection process. How the hell I got a school for black girls and my wife coming in there with a blind weed. And for the white folks in here, I'm going to have one or two white folks in my school. Because if I don't, they're going to say I'm racist. <laughs> so if you know any good white people, <laughs> email your resume. For those of y'all who want to work, email your resume or volunteer. FDMG resumes. I repeat, FDMG resumes at gmail.com. Make sure your picture is in there and a cover letter. I need security, I need bus drivers, I need sports coaches, I need sisters who know how to do natural hair, I need brothers and sisters who know how to cook good vegan food, because we're going to be 90% raw and vegan. Yeah. Talk to me, Baba, what we got? 10 minutes, 5 minutes? It's time. <laughs> Hand of my sister, she's in charge of the youth program. Come on over. She's in charge of the youth program. This is my sister right here. Y'all make sure y'all cheat her right. As I close up, brothers and sisters, in 2010, I went to Chicago on September 18, 2010. I did a TV interview. Three weeks later, I went to Harlem, New York for my first lecture on October 30th. Within 48 hours, I was an international name. I didn't know. I was back home in Philly struggling with the garden movement. I didn't know that the Lord had bigger plans for me, but for some reason, the first year of this decade that we now close out, God decided to take me and put me on top of the black conscious movement. Some of y'all don't like that, and I really could care less. But I'm here to say thank you. Okay. Make sure y'all stop at the UNIA table on the way out as well, and register yourselves and show them some love. But for these past 10 years, I've seen the world. I've helped a lot of parents save their children. But I want y'all to know I'm just getting started because 2010 will be our decade, y'all. We're going to shake it up and we're going to switch it up and we're going to unite and we're going to get over our petty differences and we're going to build our own independent black Wall Streets for the 21st century black family. I close. And anybody who want to take a picture with me, I'll be in the lobby afterwards if you want to take a photo. I didn't bring any merchandise. My new book will be out next month. If you want to pre-order it, you can get it on the website. If you want any of my unapologetically African apparel, you can also order that on the website. But you cannot wear it if you got white girlfriend. You can't wear that. <laughs> and I close with the words of my ancestor, the Honorable Frederick Douglass, who said, if there is no struggle, there is no progress. Those who profess the faith of freedom and deprecate agitation are like men who want crops without plowing up the ground. They want rain, but can't stand the thunder or the lightning. They want the ocean, but they're scared of the awful roar of its waters. Frederick Douglass said, a man may not get all he pays for, but you will pay for all that you get. And if we are ever going to be free as black people, then we ourselves must strike the first blow. Frederick said, for 20 years, I prayed on my knees to God for freedom, but the good Lord gave me no freedom till I got up off my knees and start praying with my feet. He said, if you want respect for white people, why do you look for pity? A man who pities you could never respect you, and a man who respects you has no need for pity. 
But most of all, you remember that power can cease nothing without a demand. It never did, and it never will. The most honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey, greatest black leader of the 20th century, gave us the largest black organization in the red, black, and green flag. Turns 100 years old this summer, August 2020. Mr. Garvey said, without confidence in yourself, you are twice defeated in a race of life. But with confidence, you have won, even before you have started. Yeah. The purpose of the Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy is to do two things for your son. Give him supreme self-confidence and divine fearlessness. Yeah. Yeah. Detroit, Michigan, peace and black power. Yeah. Got it. This is a killer cab production.